All right, we're back. Episode number five with Morgan Mitchell. Welcome to my podcast, Morgan. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to have you. I, I heard uh, you on Ahmed Ahmed's uh, Instagram live the other day, and I was like, oh, she sounds really interesting. I got to get her on my podcast because you fit the the thing I'm going for is inspiring, and you're still and you're funny too. It's just a, a good combo. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I got to make a quick confession to people who've heard the other episodes. I got a haircut the other day in quarantine. It was pretty strange. The lady asked me if I wanted my eyebrows done because my eyebrows grow pretty wild naturally. And uh, usually I get them trimmed down, no problem. And uh, she did it, basically cut them all off. So they're still growing back. This is my first episode <laughs> where my wife didn't make up them back in. So this is what they look like right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like a clone. So, oh my goodness. No eyebrows is pretty rough. Oh gosh, that's funny. I've never heard of a, a you know, someone asking a guy. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, normally, if they want their eyebrows when you go get a haircut. <laughs> It's pretty standard when you get a haircut um, at a barbershop for guys. Uh, okay. towards, the, towards the end of the haircut, they'll ask you if you want your eyebrows trimmed down, too, because most guys have crazy-ass eyebrows. And, okay. Uh, mine get pretty wild, too, and she took the comb and did her little thing, and like they normally do, but I looked up, and they were going. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want them going, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife's been drawing them in with makeup markers and stuff, to, um, so I don't look as stupid. <laughs> Oh my gosh. This is my first time rocking my natural new eyebrows. <laughs> so how are you doing during all this crazy times right now? You know, I'm doing pretty well. Um, I went and saw my family over the weekend for the first time since Christmas um, because okay. I have been on my own for, I think it was day 70 when I went out there. Uh, and I was just starting to feel kind of depressed for the first time. I did really well for a while there. And then uh, I just don't think it's natural to be on your own. You know, I like, I don't have yeah. uh, roommates or anything, and, you know, I'm on my own. So not seeing anyone for that long, it like started to like take its toll on me, I think. And um, yeah, so my doctor was like, why don't you just go see your family? Like you're, you're young, you're healthy. Like even if you got it, you know, hopefully it wouldn't be, he didn't think it would be that bad. So he's like, just go, you've been quarantined. So don't worry about giving it to them. Um, so it was nice. And I feel like I just got back and I feel refreshed in a way, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Solitary, yeah. solitarity is, uh, I can't even say the word is, um, is nice and important, but in small doses, we're, we're designed to be around other people. We're tribal animals. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it, there's all kinds of other things like your immune system will get, you know, will crash if you're on your own and you're not going anywhere and you're not around anybody else. So, um, so it just made sense, you know, I'm like, yeah, I need to start getting out there and being safe about it, but like getting out and being around people and I miss my family. So it was a good trip. Yeah. And I'm doing well. I mean, fortunately, I'm still able to work over, uh, FaceTime and Zoom. So that's helped a lot to like keep me busy and then uh not stress out too much about finances not everyone is in that position so i feel very blessed in that way yeah that's really cool so for people who don't know you're a personal trainer and you're doing training through zoom and live videos i'm assuming mm -hmm. yeah so uh mostly facetime but also oh, zoom okay. and, uh yeah um and i i do some like i have a six week program so uh i posted it's in my bio on my instagram and so some people uh have been taking advantage of that and i try to post every day a workout that you can do at home with very little or no equipment so um just keeping busy doing doing work yeah awesome that's uh six weeks with morgan.com right to get to that mm -hmm. yeah yeah, six <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good job yeah effects, put some eyebrows in here it's driving me nuts <laughs> <laughs> Um, so where's back home with your uh, family? Where'd you go? Oh, so I grew up in Hemet and most of my family still, still lives out there. So it's like a tiny little town, um, outside of San Diego. So, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So there's nothing much to do out there, but, um, but it's fine. Cause like when I go back home, we just all hang out at home anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. posted some pretty funny videos in the process being there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I recruited my sister. My sister was kind of against TikTok, but and most people are, right? Like, especially 
over the age of 12, they're like, yeah. oh, come on, it's for kids. But I have converted so many people. I mean, I didn't want to do it, but my Instagram got hacked and I lost it for a few days and I'm in the middle of quarantine and I'm like, what do I do? Like, yeah. I feel so, like so out of the loop. And my friend was like, get on TikTok. And I'm like, no, that's for kids. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> and and uh, then one day I was super bored. I'm like, all right, let's check this out. And then I felt super old because I did not know how to work it at all. So I had to YouTube everything. I'm calling my best friend's 12 year old kid. Like, Hey, how do I do this? And she's like, Oh, you're too old for this, but okay, let me try to explain it. And (laughs) so then I got addicted and now, uh, I've gotten like my sister did a few with me. I even put my niece in a couple and, uh, she's two. And, uh, now my sister's like, all right, I'm getting a TikTok. So she downloaded it yesterday and it's fun. It's a fun way to pass the time. Yeah, definitely. It's simple fun, but it's very entertaining for sure. Especially what you're doing. Is your sister the blonde that's with you in the videos? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's my yeah. Sister. Yep. Yeah, we attempted the Justin Timberlake, Jimmy Fallon one, and that was time consuming. We only did like half of it um, and it took like an hour and a half. <laughs> I'll pass the time in no time. <laughs> yeah. So um, with TikTok, is it, it's an app, right? I've, I've never messed with it before. I got some. Yeah, it's an app. It social media app. Okay. Yeah, it's like a social media app, and uh, it's um, just 15 seconds to a minute of just little clips. And so you can make your own, or you can just kind of uh, take other people's that you know have already done them. And um, it's like dances. You could do dances. You can do skits, like little clips from TV shows, or um, yeah. It's fun. It's it's fun. Yeah, you got some uh, hidden dance talent, too, I've seen. I've seen. Oh, thank you, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I hadn't danced since high, I was on the dance team in high school, like a hip-hop dance team, and I hadn't really done since, and so I was a little like, can I still do this? I mean, <laughs> but it was, uh, it's been fun, and it's a good, it's good cardio, and it's, uh, it's fun, and like right now, I'm used to going to, I have a ton of friends that are in the comedy world and i'm used to doing uh going to all their stand-up shows and we can't do that right now so it's uh tiktok makes me laugh like watching other people's doing my own it just makes me laugh which is so important especially right now so i have fun doing it laughing at myself and everybody else yeah my co-host on the other podcast that we do truth or theory um his sister-in-law nurse cat she's a regular on our other show she's real big into it whenever we have uh, game nights or something she always wants to do tiktok dance videos <laughs> she's, the, <laughs> she's the one that introduced that to me i get those damn songs stuck in my head too they're so catchy and they're little yeah of them. yeah but- i had to take a couple of days off of tiktok because i realized i was uh, i had them in my head as i'm trying to go to sleep and then i have them in my head when i wake up in the morning i'm like okay i gotta take a few days <laughs> off <laughs> this is too much yeah it's intense. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go into your backstory, if you don't mind. Uh, tell everybody how you became who you are, because I think you're, the origin of how you, your life started, basically, with the car accident and everything is just so interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, as much yes, so, as you want. What was that? Go into as much detail as you want. We got time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so when I was eight years old, um, my family and I, we, I grew up till I was 10 in Lake Elsinore. Um, so when I was eight, uh, my family and I were coming home from the Lake Elsinore Storms baseball game. Um, I believe it was Memorial Day weekend and, um, yeah, we were, uh, coming home and I, I went there with my, 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 uh, my mom, my dad and my little sister and we were meeting my grandpa there and three of my younger cousins and my cousins and I get along really well. And so I wanted to go home with them and we all decided to, everyone was going to go to my parents' house. So on the way home, um, I asked if I could ride with them. And so my, my parents were like, yeah, that's fine. My little sister was only three at the time. So she went you know, in the car with my, my parents. And, uh, what's crazy is I guess all day my cousin's seatbelt was broken um, I don't really talk about this part, but I'll, I'll talk about it. So, so my cousin's seatbelt was broken and, uh, I guess all day and me being like a very 
stubborn and passionate eight year old, I'm like, grandpa, you need to fix Kevin's seatbelt. <laughs> and he was like, well, we're 10 minutes away from your house. It's fine. And I said, no, you need to fix it. And um, so he pulled over. He's like, all right, fine. So he's fixing my cousin's seatbelt. My dad pulls up by him. What's going on? Uh, my grandma said, I'm just fixing Kevin's seatbelt real quick and then we'll be on the way. So my dad, then he's, he was behind us. Now my dad's in front mm -hmm. and he was in a small car and we were in a big Mercedes with a long front end back then. They were really long. So um, he fixed the seatbelt, takes off. We catch up to them. And maybe five minutes later, my dad sees this truck coming super fast. Turns out he's going 100 miles an hour. We are going about 40. So my dad has time. He swerves off the road. And then the truck hits us head on. Um, so the impact was 140 miles an hour. Whoa. And uh, my parents saw the whole thing. So, of course, they're, you know, panicked. And um, God, I can imagine. Yeah. I guess couldn't even see the car through all of the smoke. They thought it was on fire. Um, so the important part to that part of the story is if, if the cars were reversed, they said that, um, if my grandpa swerved and it hit my parents, that they would have died on impact because the car was so small. So, um, you know, it's kind of like everything happens for a reason. And then, yeah. you know, if, if we ended up getting hit, my cousin, you know, would have died and luckily we all made it, you know, cause the seatbelt was broken. So everything, you know, it was just kind of put everything in perspective, especially now looking back that, wow, everything really does happen for a reason, I believe. Um, so we all got airlifted to different hospitals, we all different injuries. And it turned out that because I was in the middle seat in the back, um, I didn't have a shoulder strap. Um, so I just had the lap, uh, strap. And so the impact burst my small intestines open, causing toxins to go all over my body. I lost half of my blood supply by the time I got to the hospital. So they put me in emergency surgery and they just told my parents, there's just no way she's going to make it. Um, so they had told my parents, they gave me a 0% chance of living. Um, my dad ended up getting a ton of friends together to donate blood. So um, I just remember getting blood transfusions. I was in and out of consciousness and um, the, the main memory I have is waking up after one of my surgeries uh, because I guess I made it through the first night and they thought, okay, wow, she has a chance of surviving this. So, um, cause they didn't expect that. So they ended up flying doctors out from all over the place to do these surgeries that they had never really done before. Um, so I know one of my doctors was the doctor that separated the uh, the Siamese twins from the head. And I don't remember his name, but I remember him telling my dad that my surgery was more difficult than that. Oh. And, and so it was, yeah, it was pretty intense. So they ended up having to remove half my small intestines, part of my colon, part of my spleen, and they had to leave my stomach open. So I remember waking up from a surgery and just looking down in my half of my stomach. I mean, my stomach was completely open. Um, so I had just this big hole and I just still remember everything, the way it felt, the smell, everything was, uh, it's, yeah. it's pretty crazy as an eight year old. And yeah. so, yeah, it was really up and down. Like some days they would give me a greater chance of surviving and some days you know, something would happen. I got pneumonia, my lungs collapsed. I was on a ventilator, a respirator. So all these things um, were just kind of up and down. So my parents didn't really know for a while if I was going to make it or not. And there were moments where I still remember waking up and looking at my mom, telling her like, you know, I, I don't want to live anymore, mom. I'm in so much pain and I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah, and she said, like, heartbreaking for a mom to hear, you know, from an eight year old. And, um, and she said, no, you're not done here. You have to, you have to fight and you have to make it through this. You're going to make it through it and you're going to grow and you're going to be big. And I remember her telling me that. And I remember having a, a feeling like I had a choice, like I could let go now or I can fight. And I remember thinking it was up to me if I wanted to or not. Um, and I don't remember this, but my dad says that I would kind of turn to him and ask him, dad, tell me the truth. Am I going to die? 
And he would say, no, no, you're not going to die. And then he would go in the hallway and just start crying because he wasn't sure. So it was a very <laughs> traumatic time. Yeah. For, for me and my family. And from there, it was just, you know, a few months in the hospital, a few surgeries. They finally did a skin graft where they took skin from my side, put it on my stomach, and then it ended up herniating. So I looked like I was pregnant at eight years old, like nine months pregnant. And they sent me home that way for a year. So um, they moved my bed into the living room, and I basically lived in the living room of my house for uh, a few months, like maybe six months. And then a year later, they went up, they, they did a, a final surgery where they wrapped all of my organs in mesh uh, to try to keep them all together. And they stapled me back up and built me a new belly button. A plastic surgeon came in and because uh, the belly button had to go in the surgery, so they kind of just made me one in surgery and um, sent me home and said, you know, we have no idea what her future will be like, but she's alive now. And they kind of just uh, sent me home that way. So my parents were like, okay. Uh, so they were very protective of me growing up. I wasn't allowed to play sports, um, wasn't really allowed to be active. And and then in high school, uh, I started, you know, one second, we're going to come back to that just a second. I want to um, ask you real quick before I forget about it. The belly button thing, they yeah. did that. Is that just for like your own appearance? So you look more like a regular person and they're trying to make mm -hmm. you feel better? Cause yeah, yeah, they were, the the doctors, yeah, yeah. My family okay. and the doctors were very cool about thinking about my future as a teenager okay as a woman just being comfortable um so yeah so they they wanted to make it as pretty as possible gotcha. so they did have like a surgeon a plastic surgeon go in and make sure that my scar didn't look as bad uh my cousin who's uh, a guy he he they didn't really they just kind of stitched him together because he had to have a surgery on his stomach as well it wasn't um as you know as crazy as mine but he they did have to cut him open and his like he jokes that he he tells people he got attacked by a bear because it looks yeah. Yeah, gnarly. Guys, cars, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so they're like right all mine. Yeah. But, but they were um yeah they were like pretty cool about mine making sure that it looked uh looked That's as really best cool. as it could. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, I have little girls. I can see how that would go. My my oldest is actually eight years old, so this is all oh, wow. crazy to think about my, what happening to my daughter. I can't imagine what your parents were going through. Oh yeah, it's um well, and then the first few weeks that I was at home, my stomach was still open. They didn't do the skin graft until later, so the nurses and doctors had to teach my parents how to pack my stomach. So if you could imagine taking your little girl home and having this huge hole in her stomach, and you have to pack it and make sure that you're not going to infect it uh so it was i remember them being very stressed and arguing about it all the time like no no you touched the glove wrong and like <laughs> freaking out yeah. trying to pack it multiple times a day with like gauze and um medicine and all that so i can't even imagine like you know and they were still in their maybe late 20s or early 30s wow. at the time so that's like that's yeah, I, I mean, I'm 33, so thinking about having to deal with that right now, um, I just, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm th I'll be 36 in about a week, and yeah, I have uh, two girls and a stepson, and that would be insane. I can't imagine. So shout out to your parents for going through that. That was not not easy. <laughs> no, not easy at all. And they were at the hospital every day. Um, so then I think about work. Um, they're both of them, like they were very, their works, their jobs were very understanding their companies about, about everything. Thank God we had a lot of support, but we had, I mean, my sister was a toddler at the time. So they're at the hospital every day, taking care of me, taking care of a toddler, trying to keep their jobs, trying to pay the bills and the drunk driver, he was drunk that hit us. Mm. Um, he didn't have insurance. Of course not. So, yeah. So, um, that was another thing. It's not like we got any money or anything like that so wow. um yeah the whole thing is uh mm -hmm. it was it was a really difficult time for my family i bet are your parents still with us mm -hmm. yeah they are awesome. yeah yeah they're great um yeah i just saw them i came home today so uh it was great seeing them i bet 
All right, before I interrupted you, you were you were about to go into the high school stuff that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. So high school was a, a difficult time because I lo- I, I was uh, out of school for most of third and fourth grade. And so to to catch up, they never had me, my mom tried to get me held back and they they wouldn't do it. Um, they were like, no, she's fine, she's fine. But I feel like I never really caught up. So by the time I got to high school, was kind of like, you know what, I'm over it. Like, I, I don't understand any of this. I'm so far behind. It kind of just, um, so so school wasn't great for me because on the academics, I felt like I was so far behind. And then physically, I'm seeing all these high school girls that are playing volleyball and are in really good shape. And we live near the beach, so not too far away. So, so they're going to like the beach on the weekends or they're having pool parties. And I didn't feel comfortable because I had this scar and I wasn't able to be active like my entire life. So I was, you know, not the thinnest girl. I wasn't ever, I would say fat, but I definitely did not feel like this fit skinny 16 year old that like I, you know, all my friends were. So it was difficult for me. I felt like people looked at me differently. I would always hear, I heard a rumor, you don't have a belly button. And I'm like, I have one. Like, I would just get, like, very, like, uh, it was, as a teenager, it's very tough. I thought boys are never going to like me. Um, so both, like, on the academic side and the social side, I struggled a lot. And I also struggled with a lot of PTSD, thinking that um, I was going to die in my sleep. What if they did something wrong with the surgery? So I would never... Uh, allow myself to sleep so I, wow. I never slept I was so scared of like my mom or my dad dying in an accident or my grandma or, and so if anybody was late or I couldn't get a hold of them I just break down crying thinking the worst like something happened to them and it was a very hard time like all through till I got out of high school I would say it was really difficult oh, I can imagine Jesus so yeah. Are you uh, do you have any like PTSD still with driving as a whole? Does it do you get anxiety from that? A little bit sometimes. I it's definitely not as bad as it used to be. Um, but I I do a little bit when, especially when I'm not driving. When I'm driving, I feel in control in some weird way, and so it's not as bad. Um, I really watch everybody else. So I've gotten really good at just even by their tires, like seeing what they're going to do before they do it. Yeah. But um, I have a hard time driving with other people because I feel like they're not as aware. Especially so. nowadays with all the distractions too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I know I have friends that always text and drive or like try to multitask and I'm like okay you can do that when you're on your own but don't do it with me in the car right yeah you're gambling somebody else's <laughs> life right a lot of people's right. lives because whoever you hit is inf- affected too exactly so, yeah so how how was it growing up you touched on a little bit but um like with kids and were they just insensitive assholes most of the time or were, did you have any cool friends oh, to pick out for you yeah for the most part, actually, everybody was really cool. If I found out that anybody was kind of making fun of me, it was always behind my back. Like, everyone was really nice to me to my face, um, which I think made it easier in a way um, because the, the people that I found out, like, would would talk badly about me or make fun of me or whatever, thinking, oh, she has special privileges. She doesn't have to do PE or whatever. It was like forever later so I was kind of over it but um but growing up yeah I felt like uh it took me a while to make to make friends but once I did uh like to this day some of my girlfriends in high school are still I still talk to them today so um so it got better towards the end like junior like junior year and senior year of high school I feel like I really started to um to get over some of those things and think you know what this is how it is some some boys were starting to pay attention to me so I thought okay maybe there's hope for me <laughs> like I just started thinking yeah. maybe it's not as bad as I I thought it would be so uh it started to get to get a little better yeah um but also high school towards that time was was also difficult because I ended up getting into a very abusive relationship with somebody older um wow that's not good so that um 
so right when I started to um, feel like I was starting to fit in, uh, I ended up getting to a relationship with, so I was 16 and he was 19. Okay. Um, and you know, the first few months he lived on the same street as, as the street I grew up on. And, um, he was like the older hot guy down the street that all the girls wanted. And all of a sudden he was attracted to me and I thought, Oh my God, I never, you know, so it, to me, it felt like a fantasy until about six months into our relationship, he started getting very abusive um, physically and sexually and emotionally. And he uh, basically like scared me into staying with him for quite a while to where I was scared to open up to anybody about what was going on. I didn't tell my parents. Um, I didn't even really tell friends or anything. I was just so scared of him. Mm -hmm. So that um, led me to party a lot, drink a lot because I didn't really know how to handle my, emotions i'm frustrated with school and i'm frustrated with my body and now i'm getting abused and it was a uh, it's like one hard, one hard time after another my right. youth was not the easiest um but eventually um i ended up calling the police and getting a restraining order and ended up you know i ended up being fine before something real serious happened but it was it got really bad before i I actually said, you know what, I would rather, you're going to kill me if I turn you in, then fine. Like, I would rather be dead than deal with this any longer. And I just called the police and I had kept record of everything. And um, so luckily it wasn't difficult for me to get a restraining order. And finally that, that was over. <laughs> you don't have uh, any brothers? Do you just have the sister? I have, yeah, I have one sister. Yeah, she's five years younger than me. That's where it all went wrong. No brothers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no brothers. brothers. Just straighten that fool up. <laughs> How long were you with him? Oh my goodness. Um, maybe three years. Okay. Yeah, quite a while. That's that's a very strange time for a, a teenager too, from sixteen to nineteen, whatever. I know for me personally, I was a complete idiot until I was about twenty five. It took a long time for my brain to develop and become an adult and just make better choices and just quit jobs left and right and bounce around doing dumb stuff and just mm -hmm. yeah you know I don't think people really get uh, Joe Rogan talks about something with the brain and head not being developed until you're 25 too but I really mm -hmm. think that's true because I feel like uh, I was a kid up until 25 for sure and then it switched and 30 I think I was about 29 30 but when I had my first kid somewhere mm -hmm. like somewhere around there uh, and then it just forced me to grow up quicker so got mm -hmm. idiots, man Where's that I, guy at now? Is he jealous? <laughs> um, so I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but last, this was a few years ago. I heard that he had gone to prison for other things. Hmm. Um, and he had gotten out and moved to, I think Florida. Um, so I'm not sure, but, but I think that's, I mean, I do know that he went to prison for quite a while for other stuff, probably drugs and, I know that when we were together, he was getting DUIs and um, getting arrested oh. all the time. Yeah, so. that must have uh, struck a nerve with you, huh? The DUI? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and I, I just look back on that time and I felt just so trapped. Um, yeah, I was just so unhealthy. It was so unhealthy, and um, and I, I just, I wanted out so badly, and I would see how he would. I had no doubt that he was you know, cheating on me and I would hear about it all the time. And, um, and then him like drinking and driving all the time. And there was, if I talked about it, I would just get into trouble for talking about it. And so it just, you know, I tried to leave and something would happen, you know, like it just was very, uh, yeah, it was a very tough time. Yeah. Those kind yeah. of situations are, are rough and um, just unfortunate, but I think it, in a way it's probably good for you and your, your overall of your story because it, for one, it gave you confidence at the beginning that you, the hot guy down the street liked you. You started getting more confidence in yourself appearance wise. And then now you know what kind of guy to stay away from. You don't want to be mm -hmm. those kind of guys and you can educate other younger girls to stay away from those kind of people too. Uh, right. Definitely. And you got, out of it. you got out of it healthy, thankfully too. So. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that everything that 
happens to us is definitely for a reason. And um, although it was like a horrible time in my life, I'm glad that I can relate to certain people that, that have been through that before. Because if, if you've never gone through it, you just don't understand. And people say, well, why didn't you leave? You're with them for three years. It's so not that easy uh, when you're a scared teenager and he's threatening to kill you or kill your family and he's chasing you around with a hockey stick breaking things like you believe him you're young and naive and scared and uh the whole it's, world it's, you don't know any different yeah you don't know any different um so yeah it was it's tough but but yeah now going through it i have thankfully never had to deal with any of that you know ever again so the moral of that story is avoid the hot guy down the street, huh? Yeah, avoid, <laughs> avoid the hot guy down the go street. Go for the decent looking friend. <laughs> <laughs> better care of you. Go for the, go for the nerdy boy in science class. Yep. Uh -huh. you guys are doing well right now. They're probably in <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I want to ask you some questions about your medical stuff too, but if it's too personal, just say pass. Uh, I don't want to invade your personal stuff. But... Oh, yeah. Um, what kind of side effects do you have from that? Because that seems like that would affect a lot of stuff. My brother, my my oldest brother was murdered in, er, in the early 90s. Him and my, my two older brothers were held up um, at an armed robbery. And my middle brother was shot in the back and they took it out of his stomach. So he's got a gnarly scar on his stomach too. And then my oldest brother was uh, murdered that night. He, goes to, to, he took two to the head. So um, I know That's my brother, crazy. yeah, it's a crazy situation. I don't know how my parents power to that they're still together they're about to make 47 years too so wow impressive um so i know my brother had a lot of complications with his stomach and stuff after all that um i personally have crohn's disease i have my own battles with aggravating stuff too how do mm -hmm. you handle that diet wise and just what what all struggles do you go through yeah um you know, luckily, up until last year, I hadn't really had any side effects that um, were serious. Um, I hadn't been to a hospital since I was, you know, eight or nine years old. And uh, yeah, and so the only thing was that I was really sensitive to certain things that I ate and my stomach would get really big and bloated and I feel really just sick and so it kind of forced me as I got older I realized I didn't have to feel that way I just had to stop eating the bad food and and just eat stuff that my that didn't make me feel like crap and so um it took me a while to figure it out because it was just so my parents didn't really know a lot about nutrition and they didn't really grow up eating healthy or making us eat healthy um and they didn't know any better because that's just how they were raised is to just right. um you know, my mom's from Oklahoma, my dad's Italian, and and we just, uh, we ate a lot of bad food growing up, but I didn't realize that, that it wasn't normal to feel, like, bloated and gross all the time, and so as I got older and started researching more, um, I just discovered over time, working with a lot of holistic doctors and stuff, that just being vegan works best for me, because my body doesn't really digest uh, meat very well. It doesn't really break it down and process it very well. Um, I don't really drink anymore because drinking alcohol, my body doesn't like that either. It just really is hard to digest. Um, sugars and stuff, all of that is just really tough for me. So cut all that out. And then um, it wasn't until last, uh, I want to say last June, um, I was having really, really bad side pain on my right side so I went to the doctor and he said get to the emergency room right away something is wrong with your intestines and so I went and uh turned out I have diverticulitis and I had a really bad infection um you know in my intestines so they kept me in the hospital for a week and just put me on an IV of antibiotics and that was um really painful and uh scary uh, because they said that for me, like usually diverticulitis isn't a huge deal because with someone that's never had an intestinal issue before, they just go in, cut out the piece that has it, um, and you're good to go. But for me, they said surgery would be a very high risk surgery. So that's why they kept me in there um, to monitor me and, and just make sure that everything was, was good to go before I, um, they sent me home because they don't want to do surgery. 
but unfortunately, uh, on Christmas Eve, I ended up with another infection. So Christmas Day was really painful for me. Uh, I tried That's to wait it out. <laughs> the next day, I went back in the hospital um, with another infection. So that was this last said, Christmas. This last Christmas. Oh wow. Yeah. So they, yeah, yeah. So I went back to uh, my GI doctor and he said, look, we don't want to do surgery, but the fact that you've had two major infections uh, within six months is not a good sign. So um, they gave me more antibiotics. It was a real painful, (laughs) another painful time. And um, basically they just said, okay, we can give it another try. If you don't have another infection, then great. But if you have another one in the next year, I just don't know what else we're going to do. And I said, so so what are my options? And they said, the only option that you have if we want to you know, make sure you, you can stop getting these infections is to go in, cut through the scar tissue, find that piece, hope that we have enough intestines left because they already removed half of my small intestines. So they are hoping that if they do have to go in and remove more, that they have enough to connect without me having a colostomy bag. Um, So the whole surgery would be very high risk. So I've just been really careful about eating a lot of fiber, um, staying away from junk food, alcohol, drinking a ton of water. I'm constantly checking in with my doctors, going into my holistic doctor. It's a lot of time and money and energy, but uh, it's what I have to do because I don't have room to mess up. So uh, for a lot of people, eating healthy is an option. They try to do it. Um, but for me, it's my livelihood. If if I don't, you know, like stick to it and be healthy, then I, you know, I might not be here. So it's, it's wow. kind of, yeah. yeah. That's intense, man. Jesus. Um, do you struggle with that at all? Do you crave certain things or do you like being on that diet? You know, I I like it now, but it is like tough when like I go, I went home for the weekend and my mom still has a ton of junk food everywhere and she loves to bake. So she made brownies and, uh, there were cookies and, um, I love Reese's and I've, I've like, I love Reese's peanut butter cups and um, I've like found out how to make my own that are healthier. But oh. when I see all that around, I do get bummed out. I'm like, oh, or like just <laughs> having a glass of wine. Like mm-hmm. I miss just being able to have like some whiskey or some wine. But like now, especially in the last year uh, with diverticulitis, I just can't chance it anymore. So I do miss things. I do like crave things or just the social aspect of it, of just sitting there and having you know, a glass of wine or something with somebody or some whiskey. I miss that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I bet you have a lot more uh, dedication than drive than I do. <laughs> I don't know. I can tell <laughs> I got the dad bod. I should be cleaning up my diet as well. Eventually I'll do it probably too late. <laughs> but that takes a lot of uh, devotion to do that. It's impressive that you can pull that off. I know you mm-hmm. say your life's on the line, but still you still have to do it and commit to it. It's not easy. Everybody it's not says, easy you know, at all, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, One of the reasons that my doctor told me to go home and see my family during this time, even with COVID, um, is because I have a lot of inflammation right now. So I can feel everything that I eat digest. So it used to, like, I used to not have any issues until the last year. And then last year when I got diverticulitis, I would have pain on my right side when something was going wrong. But right now, I guess it has to do with kind of being like sad and lonely and I was getting a little depressed um towards Mm -hmm. like the 70 day mark um I guess that messes with your uh it you know the inflammation in your body and so I'm really I was really inflamed um and and he said that a lot of that has to do with just the um like hormones the different levels of um like serotonin and all of that so he said go because I was having a lot of pain that was concerning to me because I could feel everything like under my rib cage. I could feel on the left side and then I'd feel it on the right. And then I'd feel it back on the left and I feel it in my back. And I'm like, I can feel everything digesting and it it's painful. And I thought maybe I had Crohn's disease or something. And he said, you just have 
uh, really bad inflammation right now. You need to just like go be around people, go be happy, laugh, have a good time. And you know what? I went home for like three or four days and the pain has gone away probably like 80%. So I think it's crazy that that affects it, but I guess yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah, laughter and happiness is the best medicine. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Who it knew? Really is. You're, you're living proof of it right now. It's crazy knew? how important that stuff is, but it boosted boosted you back, and that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you too about before we got too far, and I want to switch to the other side of where you are now. Um, son of a bitch, I lost my thought. All right, we'll jump into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now you're a personal trainer. What At what point did you flip the switch and be like, okay, I'm going to get deep into fitness and then now I'm going to start teaching fitness? Yeah. So, um, so when I was, let's see, 22, I got into a, a serious relationship with somebody um, who needed to move to Arizona for dental school. So I went with him. I was doing photography here in LA um, had a business. It was pretty successful. And then I kind of gave it all up, moved to Arizona with him. Um, I still wasn't very healthy. Like I was working for a chiropractor who was very healthy and his, his, uh, the whole office, like they were working out and they're eating healthy. And I'm like, uh, I just like, it was like all new for me, but I started to get really interested in it. Um, one of our patients was a trainer. She's, um, marathon runner. So I ended up hiring her, um, and learning a lot from her and she really inspired me. So that's kind of where it all started. And then that relationship ended, um, we were going to get married. We had a house and, and all that, but then found out he was cheating on me with his assistant at work, uh, one of his coworkers. And so I left, um, basically with nothing, and uh, moved back to California. I didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, I think I was like 25 at the time. And uh, yeah, I had no idea what I was gonna do. So I stayed with my grandma for a little bit and got really into fitness because he used to put me down a lot and say, your thighs are really fat. Like you really need to do something about that or look at your arms and he would body shame me a lot. And then he cheated it on me. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, like I believe I was believing him. Like, I don't like the way I look either. And I needed to do something about it. So I ended up getting a gym membership at LA fitness and, uh, just like researching how to work out and started eating healthier and that's what really got me through that breakup and one of my my aunts was like you know they have this course at the community college you should take it um even if it's just for yourself but maybe you want to do training and I said yeah that's not a bad idea I just don't have the money and my grandma said you know I'll lend you the money so um she lent me the money I went to back to school got certified um then, you know, came to LA for an interview to work at Equinox and got it. So, um, so yeah, that's how all that started. Awesome. I remember what I was going to ask you and it's kind of ironic that I forgot cause it's uh cannabis. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not high right now. <laughs> but, um, did, have you tried any of that stuff for your healing or any of your issues that you're having? Um, CBD I use a lot. Um, I don't smoke, um, or anything like that. But I do use a lot of CBD rubs, which helps a lot, uh, especially my back. I have a really bad back injury. So, um, you know, from the accident, my back is kind of, if in an x-ray, it's like sideways (laughs) crazy. And my neck is on like cricket and (laughs) all the stuff is going on. (laughs) So I have a lot of neck pain. I have like uh, herniated discs in my and my neck and my lower back. And so uh, CBD rub helps a lot. Um, and then for sleep stuff, sometimes it's, it's difficult for me to sleep. So I'll take a little CBD, like, um, just a dropper or something to help me, but, and that does help. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always interested in that because I just got into that world within like the last year or so. And, um, right now I'm unemployed. I got laid off in the oil field and, uh, Um, I've been enjoying it a little bit too much lately (laughs) because I never (laughs) had before. (laughs) I missed that whole era in my life, but, um, it's nice. It's definitely a relaxer. Yeah. I, um, you know, I had tried, uh, smoking a couple of times, but I just would get like 
anxiety. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Like, I know there's, I don't know much about it. I'm so, I don't uh, like, oblivious. Mm. But I know that, like, some are supposed to calm you. I don't know what I've done in the past, but I do know that it's just not helped at all. It's, like, yeah. made me paranoid and I get anxiety and I'm like, has anyone died from smoking weed before? <laughs> yeah. So I stick to my C B D. Yeah. I don't blame you. It's it's different for everybody for sure. My first few times were like that too. It was more um more uh, anxiety that it brought on and then other times it just makes you way too relaxed and it's like I can't get anything done. I'm just gonna go take a nap. But um yep. It's nice when nights you can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, all right. So, so you're a personal trainer now. You're, you're kicking ass with that. Life's better now. You, uh, mm. sure, men are all over you now and you're fighting them off. <laughs> you don't have thank those you. issues anymore. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, it, it's funny now that I'm, I'm 33 and I've dated a lot and had a few you know serious relationships and now I know it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted I feel like with my second relationship the one that um that ended up cheating on me at the end of it I realized you know I thought he was like the one and that he was like the perfect man but really because I was used to someone beating me and cheating on me and lying to me and he turned out he was like on drugs and alcohol he was just better than that you yeah. know what i mean what he, he just didn't he, he was just better than that but he wasn't great um mm. looking back i just i was so because i started so low i feel like i just continued to get a little better and a little better and a little better in my choosing and then <laughs> but now finally at 33 I know what I want. I know what I don't want. I've dealt with having narcissists and, you know, abuse and liars and, and then great guys, sweet guys that just like weren't for me for one reason or another. But, um, but now, you know, I'm really good at being able to tell right away um, if someone's for me or not. I know exactly what I want. And so the good thing about that is yeah I know what I want the bad thing is like I used to be able to go well he's cute and or he's successful like but now I can't lie to myself because I know what I want <laughs> so it's yeah. like hard That's for me important. to find somebody yeah. that I'm interested in uh and in really getting serious with or dating so I do go through it's like one date and done one date and done maybe two dates and done because I just know yeah. uh kind of right away if it's what I want or not but yeah I think in general you're gonna you're gonna know pretty soon early on I wouldn't waste your time with people that you're like iffy about or just not not setting right with you I think when when it happens you're single still right you haven't found Mr. Right yeah I've been single for about a year okay yeah when you yeah. find him you'll know yeah I hope so <laughs> yeah. I think so That's I think so it's interesting. Yeah. it's interesting now with uh COVID um I've still been like dating, but just over the phone, which I like in a way because you don't have to like commit yourself to a dinner or something. Like you just like talk, talk to them over FaceTime and see if you vibe or not. And because you've never met them and you never have to, it's easy for you to say, you know, I just didn't, I didn't really vibe with you. You're great, but I don't think it's going to work. And there's really no pressure and you don't feel as bad for some reason when you do it over the phone where in person it's a lot harder to like I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or anything like that. yeah, that's, <laughs> but, um, it's so strange dating uh, during the pandemic quarantine you're doing it through FaceTime and through FaceTime. yeah <laughs> which is funny click out you're like oh, okay in the call click <laughs> yeah yeah I had um somebody saw world. Me. yeah somebody saw me on the live that you I think saw me on yep. and uh, and asked uh for my for my number and this person is really uh successful and and attractive and I thought okay great um sure and then I talked to him and the first thing out of his mouth is dude like he calls me dude and I'm like you want to date me and you're calling me dude and then he's like I mean we might just be like chill friends I mean who knows and I'm like you're already setting us up to just be friends like 
And I just realized, I don't know if it's, it was his insecurities or if this is just who he is, but right off the bat, within the first 30 seconds, I'm like, this isn't going to work. And then the conversation just got worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, okay, so the old me would have said, well, he's cute and he's successful and you're single. And, but now I know what I want and what I don't want. And so it's, a lot easier for me to go, no, nope, red flags, done. <laughs> yeah. Pay attention to those red flags. They're important. So yeah. did you talk to him through FaceTime or on the phone or how did y'all do that? Mm-hmm. Um, so with that conversation, we talked over the phone. It was our first time talking. Um, yeah. So it just, you know, he basically just said, uh, you know, where do you live? I told him. He said, oh, well, I live on the other side, so that's just not going to work for me, I don't think. And what time do you get up your trainer? Do you get up early? Oh, yeah, that doesn't work for me because I don't get up early. And I'm like, okay, I think Winter. we're done with this conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would say if you're doing it through like a FaceTime or a video chat, the, the best out for that situation is to be like, um, man, I'm getting a bad signal right now. And then <laughs> yeah. minute, like, are you still there? Exactly. Still there? You froze. And then just hang up. <laughs> can you hear me i can't hello <laughs> get out of there <laughs> it's such a strange uh time to be dating i i got in my wife and i met um right at like the beginning of facebook basically we're we i think we met on myspace um around that time period. not met yeah. on MySpace, but we met in that time period so this is before all the dating apps and everything so that stuff's all alien to me but i find it very interesting uh, yeah dating is uh especially in LA, I think maybe it's just difficult everywhere, but I find in LA it's really difficult because, um, there's so many options here. Everyone is pretty and everyone's successful. And, and when you get guys, they either want to, I feel like it's like, it's like never, never land. It's like a bunch of, uh, like Peter Pans that just like don't grow up. They're in their forties or their fifties. And they're like, look at George Clooney. Like I have time. I have time and they just think they have time and like women are like well we want kids and we don't have a lot of time and so like you get the guys that just want to party and go out and not be serious and um or they just you know want someone that can further their career or they're very selfish because they're working on their acting career or singing or whatever it is and um it's difficult to find somebody that's just like normal and down to earth and looking to settle down and have a normal life. Like LA is difficult to find that. So I bet, yeah. You gotta filter through a lot of superficial stuff in that in that world for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, my sister uh, just got married a few months ago and I believe she met her husband on Tinder too. So and they're they're doing great. So there's Oh that. wow. <laughs> there's that. I haven't ventured into the online dating thing. I get a little nervous with that. And I I think it's, uh, you know, I I feel like guys have a hard time staying focused when they've got, like, 15 girls that they're talking to on those things. Like, yeah, you know I, don't, I, mean? I don't understand that whole world. I don't, I don't feel like there's any way to – I mean, my sister's are an exception, but I feel like that's just set up for, like, booty calls, basically. It's hard to get a real relationship out of that. Yeah, I feel like that's probably the expectation you have to go in is uh, no one is probably looking for anything serious on these things. And if something naturally happens, like organically out of it, then great. Like, I think people may have success in that. But I can't imagine you going into it thinking I'm going to find my soulmate when they're talking it's like the bachelor for you know normal people (laughs) they're like talking to 15 different people and uh i just don't yeah and then everything on there is like superficial right everyone's putting their best photos or maybe even photoshop photos and then they're putting the the best little snippets snippets of like themselves and showing their their best selves which is so not really them at all and I just don't know how it, but I guess it works for some people. It just gave me an idea. We should make a new app where it's a dating app where you have to post all real stuff. Some of you, you have to post a picture of your profile picture has to be you when you wake up in the morning and Mm -hmm. (laughs) real stuff, real facts about yourself. You can't put any flies. It has to be validated by friends. Yeah. There should be like no, no makeup, no filters. Like the app will be able to tell if you've used a, photoshop app or something 
Yeah. And uh, we'll just delete it. So you yeah. got to put something real up. Yeah. <laughs> you had too many drinks. Are you driving home or what are you doing? Like all the realistic <laughs> situations. <laughs> I'll throw out all yeah. the douchebags and skanks and stuff on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck to you on that. Cause that's, I can't imagine trying to date in that area. That'd be rough, but the good thing, the good thing is you have a lot to pick from. So that's cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's rough, but you know, I, I've learned to really like being on my own. So I've kind of like, it is on my heart to get married and to have kids, but I also love my life yeah. and I've kind of come to uh, terms with it. Like if I don't find anybody, then I am happy with my life and who I am and my friends and my family. And I cannot complain about my life at all. So if this is what it is, then I'm, I'm good with that. But yeah. Yeah, everyone wants to find love. Everybody wants to be with somebody and have that person. So I think it will happen for me. I just, for whatever reason, it's just not the time. Yeah, for sure. It definitely will. You're 33 is young, too. My sister is, I think, 40, 41 now, too. And um, she had a kid already years ago. Um, but uh, my niece is actually an adult now. And she's a great kid, too. Um, but the guy she found on there, I believe it was Tinder. He's a great guy, too. We love him. He's part of our family now. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it definitely will happen. You're a great catch. You'll find a good guy. Thank you. I have all the confidence in the world for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so give me a, a quick breakdown on what the what entails for the six weeks of uh, Morgan Challenge. Oh, yeah. So um, with the six weeks, you get three workout instructional videos per week. Um, so you can do them at your convenience. Uh, you just have to get all three in 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 one week and i recommend that on your off days you do cardio for an hour 45 minutes to an hour um so ideally it would be like monday with me tuesday cardio wednesday with me thursday cardio friday with me um and then you can option to do saturday cardio or take the whole weekend off um but so that's just an example but something like that um each are about 45 minute workouts um, and most, uh, I mean, you have the option of adding equipment, but it's mostly body weight stuff. Um, the only thing you would really need is like maybe a resistance band and some small weights. Cool. Uh, so yeah. For men and women or just women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for both. Yeah. Men and women. Um, it's, it's like a hit style, um, okay. training program. So you do get your heart rate up and still, and burn fat, but still burn, uh, build muscle. Um, and yeah, it works for, for either gender. And, um, I tried to, you know, like make it very, uh, easy to use as far as like at home. And then there are options where if you want just like a beginner version, and then also I demonstrate like a, uh, intermediate or, um, advanced version that you can do of the same, uh, workout. Awesome. What's, yeah. like, what's your ideal student? Like if you had to, you could go into a laboratory and create your own student basically to be a uh, part of your program. What, what, what kind of person do you get the most excited about? Um, okay. So I, I have one right now that I just love training. She lives in New York actually. And I train her. I've been training her for a year now um, just over, over the phone. And she's like my perfect student because she's consistent. We train three times a week. Um, on i have her do cardio right after we're done because that if you're wanting to lose weight or burn fat the the best thing you can do is lift for 45 minutes and then you get into that fat burning zone and then you do 20 minutes of cardio after just to keep burning so you've already burned through everything that you've eaten um and now all you're going to do is burn strictly fat for like another 20 minutes and then because you've just worked out you're going to continue to burn calories throughout the day if you're working out in the morning um, so she's really good about doing her cardio right after we, we're done. She works out on the days that, um, she has cardio on the days that she's not with me. Um, she rests at least one day a week, which is also really important. And then anything, this is the, the exciting part is anything nutrition wise that I ask her to do. She does it, oh, which is awesome. the hardest part to get people to do. They can show up to their workouts, but getting them to actually commit to changing their lifestyle when it comes to food 
and alcohol is really difficult, but she will listen to anything and she sees the results. She looks great and she feels great. Um, so that is like my favorite is somebody that actually does what I ask them to do. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. That's, <laughs> that takes a lot to do that. So that's, that's impressive. She's able to do that. That's my biggest weakness. I love working out. I love anything to do with it. But when it comes to dieting, I love my fried chicken too. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm weak when it comes to that. But yeah, that's awesome that she can do all that. Yeah. Well, my favorite thing to do is take like recipes that people like and try to just make a healthier version. So, um, like I have these tacos that I went, I went live. Um, I think it was last weekend just to like kind of demonstrate how to make them. But I used to love Taco Bell. I used to have Taco Bell all the time and I love their double decker taco supremes oh, yeah. I would all the time. So I thought of a healthier way to make them. So I take these, uh, almond tortillas put some vegan cheese on it to melt. And then I take a hard shell um, taco that's like gluten free and put that in there. And then I make beyond meat. So it's vegan, put that in there and then just do like um, more of the vegan cheese, some lettuce, some avocado. And I make like my own like healthier version of the double decker taco. And I do that with everything uh, with pizzas and everything, just trying to, to keep it really healthy and mostly vegan, but so you don't feel like you're depriving yourself. You still feel like you're getting that good food. It's just yes. it's a lot healthier. Eating Taco Bell though, you're you're still not off the vegan thing because it's not real meat anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> don't know what the hell you're eating. <laughs> Who knows what that yeah. is? <laughs> yeah. I possibly have that much ground meat out there. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't even want to know what part of animals that is. But. <laughs> Right. I know when I think about fast food it's so disgusting yeah I can't believe I used to I mean especially with my stomach issues I, I used to eat that stuff all the time and you know I was just talking to a friend about this the other day when I was in some pain I'm like I can't imagine where I would be if I didn't get into health and fitness and I was still eating the way I was in my 20s in my early yeah. 20s my teenage years if I was still eating like that now I would probably be dead. I don't know. Cause even eating healthy now I have like diverticulitis and all these issues that people are like, you're 33. Why do you, and you eat healthy and you work out. Why do you have diverticulitis? I'm like my surgeries, like it just, yeah. um, it really aged me. You would have a, you would have a sexy body like mine if you didn't eat <laughs> <laughs> wearing a macho man t-shirt when you're in your thirties. <laughs> What a loser. No. Um, oh, one thing I do want to talk to you about, too. I saw in an article that you listen to Hans Zimmer music type scores when you're working out. I love that kind of music. That's cool. I've never you heard of do? that. Yeah. I do. I love it. I, I feel like I'm in an action movie, which is like my dream. Yeah. Not that I'm an actress. I, I, you know, but I just, I watch movies like Wonder Woman. And I'm like, man, even if I could just film a scene. Like I should create like a TikTok, a yeah. 15 second clip where it's like an action movie <laughs> because it was, uh, it's like so cool. So working out to like Hans Zimmer um, or some sort of like, you know, uh, score, it just makes you feel like you're in an action movie and it makes me work out harder. Yeah. Um, I feel like my burpees are, are stronger and <laughs> like yeah. everything. I believe just, it. Uh, yeah, I feel like it just gives me that extra boost of energy to like really make me work hard. Yeah, I've always listened to that kind of music uh, regularly when I'm drawing or writing stories because I do those for hobbies. And uh, man, they help me get in the mindset completely. I never thought about doing it for working out. That's pretty cool. You should try it. Yeah, you should try it. I, to work out. <laughs> I sh you should try it. Let me know how it goes. I do have a friend that does smoke a lot of weed. And he, I got him listening to Hans Zimmer while he's working out. But he does it high and he loves to work out high. And he's like, oh my God, going for a run high listening to Hans Zimmer? I feel like I'm Superman. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman scar is pretty cool too. That pumps me up too. I like that little. It's very cool. Yeah, I've worked out to that soundtrack. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right, you ready to get into the six questions? 
They're oh, not yeah. yet, but they will be shortly. We're going a little bit over time. You still okay? You got time? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, number one. Um, what movie can you watch over and over and not get tired of it? Breakfast at Tiffany's. I'm a girly girl at heart. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey Hepburn. I love my classic movies. They grew up watching like all Audrey Hepburn uh, movies and um, like Sound of Music, like a lot of musicals and stuff. So, but Breakfast at Tiffany's, I could watch over and over. Yeah, I think Sound of Music is my mother's favorite movie. She loves that movie. A good one. Yeah. It's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. <laughs> it is long. Yeah. Um, number two, what's the best practical joke that you've played on someone or that has been played on you? So I don't know if I've ever played a practical joke on someone but uh, I do have a friend in, I, in high school that would play practical jokes on me all the time. Peter, shout out to Peter. <laughs> we still talk. Um, he put all of his lawnmower grass on my truck. We all had our parking spots in high school. And I remember coming out in my entire truck. He must have had like four or five lawnmowers full of grass. He like dumped it all over my truck and for weeks, where my parking spot was, there's was just a, a ring of, <laughs> of grass around my parking spot. It took forever to go away. Um, and everyone would like make fun of me for it. And same guy, one day I woke up and go outside and there's all these traffic cones and golf balls in my yard, like thousands of golf balls. And my dad made me pick them all up. And I got so mad at him. I'm like, you should be here picking them up. And he just laughed. And, it's my kind of guy. I like Peter. That's <laughs> good stuff. Um, number three, what song do you have to sing along with if you hear it? You're going to laugh. Fro <laughs> oh, God. From Frozen, <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no. I just, no. Yeah, I went to see my niece, and that's her favorite movie. And every time I hear Let It Go, I just have to sing it. I dealt it out. <laughs> that damn movie man my daughters were obsessed with that movie then they came out with part two and now they sing the other song that's on there did you see that one with her part two? i haven't seen that i haven't seen that yet but she loves that movie yeah. um and i know that she probably knows all the words to that at two years old but um her and i were singing let it go quite a bit she has this little microphone and you you press the button and it sings the song so we were singing that all weekend <laughs> good times with her aunt but um, I saw Snoop Dogg. I saw Snoop Dogg the other day. Was had to go in his car and just let it go. And he, I don't know if you saw it, but Snoop Dogg posted. He's like, I just have to sit in my car for a second and just let it go. And he's like, Yeah, I'm sitting here listening to Let It Go from Frozen. And he was just sitting there listening to it, like <laughs> in his car by himself. And I'm like, Okay, so I'm not alone. If Snoop Dogg does it, I'm not in too bad shape. Yeah, that's a song that definitely gets stuck in your head. We were talking about that earlier. If I hear that, it's that in the Moana soundtrack. The, that one has oh. too that were just, they're good stuff. I mean, it's great for kids, but good Jesus, like, I'm tired of hearing it. I love Moana, yeah. yeah <laughs> I'm like that a big kid at heart. <laughs> yep. All right, so Disney song. You have a kind of a Disney princess look about you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you could go do that in Disney, but I heard that job is hell, though. Thank you. My sister was, um, a Disney princess at like really? uh, Disney parties. Yeah. Oh, wow. she was hired, Yeah. She worked for a company. And so she would go as um, both of the girls from frozen, both princesses. Really? She would go to parties. Yeah. As both of them. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And I think she was also Cinderella. I want to say she's a blonde. Yeah. So she, she does all the, yeah. My dream of being a Disney princess. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, what is something that really irritates you? Oh, um, I really get irritated when people text like one or two words and then text, like they can't finish a whole thought before they send the text. So they're like, hey, send. And I get a ding. What are you doing? Ding. I'm doing this. Ding. And I just hear all these. I'm like, finish a sentence before you hit send. Like, <laughs> why are you sending individual like get like just finish your thought and then hit send because like hearing my phone go ding 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 and then look and it's like oh my god 
uh, there's two different things going on with that. That's people that want to keep you on the loop and keep you wanting what they're, what's coming next with them. And then you have the innocent version of it, which is my dad, who does the same thing. My dad is hilarious. He's uh, an older gentleman, but he's an awesome man. And he, um, he'll even text B, BRB, be right back. Like, you don't have to text be right back. Just don't respond for a while. <laughs> Just start talking. I'll say, hey, dad. Um, how are you, how are you doing? Or something like that. Good. And he'll say BRB. I'm like, you just, just text me when you're available <laughs> next time. <laughs> no rush. That's so cute though. Yeah. I love my dad. He's awesome. <laughs> I actually did a, an episode with my dad and my brother is the first episode that's on YouTube and my channel. Oh, uh, that's yeah. So you guys are all really close. Yeah, we as a kids, man, all we did was fight. Uh, it was a, a battle zone in that house. But as adults, my brother is basically my best friend, and my dad's our our greatest role model because he's just been through so much shit. He stuck it out with my mom. Uh, not that my mom's a hard thing to stick it out with, but she had a lot of health issues, and we were horrible kids. We we went from being rich from him having his own business to being poor from it going under, and I'm just we did all kinds of stuff, and uh, they they powered through a lot of crazy shit. So. And they're still together, and you guys are all close, so that's great. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful, yeah. That's awesome. Yep. I think he said the other day, it was like, they're going to be hitting 47 years married, which is crazy. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. good role model to have. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, my parents are still together as well, and um, yeah, it's so rare these days, and they've been through it too. They've been through their own drama, and then like my accident, and um, all kinds of stuff and my dad's had a ton of accidents and they've had their own like marital problems but um, at the end of the day they still stick it out and they're actually better today than they ever have been which is great it's just keep it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah it is the most important thing is to pair, pair up with somebody that you're happy being good friends with because that's all it comes down to in the long run all the yep. attraction and all the dumb other superficial stuff will go away and go up and down and stuff and you, you got to enjoy who you're with basically definitely yeah yeah that's just my expert advice being a few years older than you <laughs> <laughs> i get the shakes when i talk about my own personal stuff man bringing up my family i get like <laughs> are you like that at all with your your accident you had as a kid or you said it so much you're you immune to it with the accident not so much because i have uh talked about it quite a bit but when it comes to like uh, relationship stuff. Um, I did get the, my last long-term relationship was with an actor. And so people ask me about it all the time. Um, and to this day, I still get like comments about it on Instagram and direct messages all the time. Like, I miss you guys. You guys are going to get back together. And like talking about it when people ask about it, I get really like nervous and kind of like I, my eye wants to twitch <laughs> I don't like talking about it. <laughs> because it's not just me it's like talking about my own stuff is fine yeah. but I don't want to talk about other people or like it's I feel like it's not fair um yeah, to bring up their lives you know so it's hard but I also don't want people to feel like um I'm like being a bitch and not wanting to talk about it you know like I but I it's not my own it's not like my own stuff to talk about. I don't like, uh, if it's just my stuff, I'm, I'm an open book, but talking about other people's lives, I get really like anxious, like nervous. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with talking about other people's stuff. That's why I'm hosting. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, hosting. Being interviewed, my jaw shakes the whole time. My hands are jittery. <laughs> I talk about past stuff. It's weird. Um, okay. Number five, what is an item in your home that is special to you for sentimental reasons? Oh, okay. I have it right here. I don't know what these are called. I forget. Maybe you know, because I always forget the name of them. Uh, like geostone type stuff? Yeah, geostones. So this one was my great grandma's and um, she passed when I was 15, but we were very, very close. Um, and this was hers. And I just remember her having it on the table. And as a kid, I would go play with it. And I remember like as a little, little kid, I remember go, ah, ah, ah don't touch that you're gonna break it and then I always like was drawn to it and when she passed and everybody all the family was like going through her jewelry and all that I grabbed this and I was like I'm taking this with me and so that's so it's cool here yeah so just so uh, as a reminder every day when I look at it I miss her a lot yeah that's awesome you had a, a good grandmother that you were close with my wife's uh, grandmother is an awesome woman too and she was really close to her 
she's got some stuff like that as well. And I, my, my mother's dad, my papa, which is what we call him because I'm from the South. Um, I have a beer can that was in his, uh, I guess like their, their room to their green room, I guess it was. I'm not sure. He was a farmer too. So, um, he had a, a beer can from the Super Bowl of 1979 for the Steelers, which I don't really care about that part of it, but it's never been opened before. And I was big into football as a kid and I always thought that was so cool that he had that and it was never open and I got that. So that's in display over there in my studio. Um, but it's not really like the thing itself. It's just the memories with it. It's just so cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I also like went for her. <laughs> no, those are the things that matter. Like the the things that get memories. I still have um along with that, I took all of her Shirley Temple VHS tapes, which obviously I'm not going to watch. It's on VHS, but but uh we used to, you know, she was my great grandma, so she was older and and so she would watch me a lot, but she didn't have a ton of energy. So we would watch a lot of movies and we would watch classic stuff. So I have all of her Shirley Temple VHS. We used to set up like a little fort in her living room and watch those and have picnics. And like, those are the things that the, the sentimental stuff that mean a lot yeah. to me. Sweet. Yeah. I, um, I haven't heard the name Shirley Temple in a long time. I forgot about her. <laughs> yeah. My mom's a big fan of her. Is she? See, your mom and I would get along with yeah. Sound of Music and Shirley Temple. <laughs> yeah, you already uh, same breed, same click. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up grew up hearing that in the, her room while she's watching Shirley Temple. I'm like, who is this little kid? Why are you watching this? <laughs> yeah, my great grand. You probably have seen my uh, my grandpa. He's still alive. He's gonna be ninety this year. He was an actor, and so was his dad, my great grandfather. Uh, he was in The Wizard of Oz. My oh, really? my great grandfather. He was a monkey in the wizard of oz wow. uh didn't speak a word of english he just moved here from sicily um but my grandpa was in a ton of shirley temple movies and to this day he still talks about her it was like the highlight okay, of his cool. life yeah that's really <laughs> cool you tell my mom that she'll like that oh. um last question number six what accomplish what accomplishment are you most proud of you got me all shaky over here <laughs> <laughs> sorry me to talk about yourself yeah i'm talking about me uh, We're done. <laughs> Um, so I say that my, uh, I'm most proud of, I think just overcoming, um, everything that I've been through and being, you know, the person I am today. Cause I think a lot of people in my position would have kind of taken the easy way out. I don't know if I, we talked about this, but when I first moved to LA, um, I was homeless and I bought a car at an auction cause during the breakup, uh, I had to leave. I had a Mercedes at the time. I left it with him because I couldn't take care of the payments. I didn't know what I was going to do for work. So I went to an auction, bought a car for a thousand dollars that barely ran, had almost no paint on it. Um, wow. and moved here to work at Equinox and I lived in my car and I had a lot of opportunities to be with men, uh, that wanted to take care of me that were, you know, obviously <laughs> for the wrong reasons or, right. um, you know, older men that were like, Hey, sleep with me and I'll give you, you know, this room in my house or, um, you know, I'll give you everything that you want. I'll put you on an allowance. And I never, ever took the easy way out. And I am, Found it. You know, <laughs> um, and I feel like just, just go, you know, going from where I was at to where I am now and having a successful business on my own. Um, you know, I completely quit Equinox and, I have my own business and um, just, you know, being where I am now and knowing that I worked really hard to be where I'm at and I love, you know, where I'm at, who I am and knowing that I never took the easy way out, I think is uh, my proudest accomplishment. That's awesome. Yep. I love it. I know a girl who did take that route too. She wasn't homeless at the time, but she was in her own situation. I'm not going to call her out, but yeah, her life did not go the way she wanted to. So it's a, it's a simple fix for a long-term, uh, long-term problem, basically. Yeah. Well, I think, awesome. yeah, I think when you do that, uh, you think, uh, and not, I'm not speaking for everybody, but personally, if I would have taken those, I would have thought less of myself and I don't know where I would be mentally. And uh, I mean, women, especially, I think when they do something like that are really hard on themselves and, and then start believing that they're, you know, not worth, not worth what they really it. are. And yeah. And it just like messes with your, with your head and just the way I was raised. Um, 
I just, I believe in God. I knew that it would all work out and, um, and it did. I just knew I had to hold in there. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of, uh, perseverance. I can't talk today. You got me all yeah. shaky. So all my words are all jacked up, but you're very strong. <laughs> I got you talking about Shirley Temple and Sound of Music. You're, you don't know what to think. <laughs> you're off my, my flow. <laughs> yeah, you're a very strong, very devoted person, and uh, it's definitely going to pay off for you. It's, those are great qualities, and I wish the best for you, and I think great things are going to come in your future. Your future. Um, thank you so much. That means a lot. Thank you. And thank you for asking me to be on your podcast. That means oh. a lot. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. You're a great guest and I'm still early on your episode five. So you're going to set a nice trend and put the standard up there for my next guest. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I, yeah, I hope I did you, did you right. You did. You did great. Um, where can my listeners find you and support? Um, you? So, yeah. So on Instagram, I am uh, at Morgan M Mitchell. I'm a triple M. <laughs> so Morgan M Mitchell on Instagram, um, on TikTok, <laughs> I'm Momo Mitchell Zero. That, that nickname was given to me by my, my two-year-old niece, Momo Mitchell Zero. Um, my email address, if you guys are interested in uh, doing my six-week program, um, you can either go to my bio on my Instagram or my email address is mmtrainsla at gmail.com. Okay, cool. And I'll get those links from you too, and I'll add them to the notes on the, the episode so they can click awesome. them easy. Well, we did it, Morgan. We're done. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Stay in touch with me. Yes, definitely. Have you back on eventually. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Have a lovely week, and I'll talk to you soon. Oh, uh, by the way, I like to end my episodes as awkward as possible. So, whatever you can do to make it awkward, let's do it. Awkward. So, yeah, just awkward. Awkward. Yeah. uh, That's uh, okay. Um, well, I think awkward would be you and I singing, let it go, like finish it off strong. We both know the words. <laughs> words. <laughs> that is pretty damn awkward. I like how you played that on me. <laughs> if you're going to make me be awkward, you're going to be awkward too. Yeah. I'm going to put it on the background so it's not all on me. Oh, okay. That's good. We'll just sing like the little chorus part. How dare you do this to me? <laughs> now this song's gonna be stuck in my head. I gotta re- rethink my awkward plan here. <laughs> Let's see if you can hear it on there or not. Is oh yeah, good? I can hear that. Do you wanna just sing the chorus part? <laughs> the chorus kick in it. Have to be. <laughs> I don't know the word. Here it goes. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> That was horrible and awkward. <laughs> <laughs> that was the worst. Uh, you asked for it. <laughs> yeah. My daughters already think I'm not cool, so you just made it worse for me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they got to that age in their teenage years, but they're not even 10 yet, and they already think I'm not cool. So. Aw, they'll think you're cool when, when they're older. They better. <laughs> they better All right, Morgan, have a good one. Goodbye. Thank you. You too. Bye.